Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead, if you would. Let's find us a seat. Grab us a hymnal. We'll get started this morning. Let's turn to number 87, Joy to the World. 87. Terry Bowles, brother, won't you open something prayer, bro? Father, we are thankful, Lord God, for this day. We give us, Lord God, for the opportunity to come here. Thank you, Lord God. I know we feel our passion with your word, Lord God. And it's made a lot in our hearts, our minds, and your word, Lord God. Help us be not only hearers of the word, but doers also, Lord God. Just thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that saved you from hell, Lord God. And just help this church and every saved person in the coming weeks and years to be a better witness to the cause of Jesus Christ. We thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat>
schedule all this out about Christmas there, uh, that it was a work in progress uh, back in 2011. We just had uh, a brief morning service. We didn't have Sunday school, and then uh, because of the traveling plans of many, uh, understandably, we were down. We understood that. Uh, the evening was quite a bit better. And i uh, been conversing with some different folks there about your plans and things that uh, you can't get out of. And I really want to work with everyone on this, sir. So uh, I've came. <laughs> and I said it's a work in progress. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I realize this time of year can be a burden for folks running here and there. Uh, and I uh, don't want this to be something uh, where you think of that uh, in the context of church, you know, where we've got to go to church, that kind of thing. So I realize I'm not going to make everyone happy about this thing, but uh, I'm trying to be flexible. And uh, no doubt it is a special time of the year involving many blessings that God has uh, given to us. And so for Sunday, what we're going to do, we're going to revise it. Uh, we will not be meeting Sunday morning. We will be meeting Sunday evening. And we'll try to go out strong uh, on Christmas then, Christmas evening. Now, that moves the uh, youth program to the Wednesday before. All right. So in your bulletin, it's the 25th. I hadn't got with Sister Katie before we printed it. But it's uh, the 21st, actually. We'll be having the youth meeting that Wednesday, the 21st. And then there'll be no Sunday morning meeting on Christmas Day, but there will be a Sunday evening meeting for those of you that can be here. Uh, we hope you'll make it. And uh, then the following Sunday, on New Year's Day, we want to have a fellowship dinner, all right, for the new year, 2017. We all get together and just kind of kick the year off right there uh, on uh, that following Sunday. So again, youth service will be the 21st on Wednesday night, the Christmas uh, meeting. There will be no service Sunday morning, but there will be service Sunday evening, and then a fellowship dinner uh, the following Sunday there. So uh, hopefully that, that's a blessing. Like I said, I know we can't make everybody happy on anything, but uh, uh, we do our best, <laughs> amen. And uh, hopefully that, that'll, that'll work out more with what you've got planned. Um, uh, there is no... Uh, meeting tonight for the young people that were coming early for practice. Uh, they won't be meeting tonight. They will be practicing on Wednesday night. All right, now birthdays this week. You've got Julia Spradlin, Becky Myers, Ashton Henry, Laura Butts, and Mason Llewellyn. And then anniversaries this week is Brother Joey and Sister Erica Zachary. So we trust the Lord to bless them. All right, uh, let's have a uh, word of prayer, Brother James. Would you pray for us, please, Bill? Thank you, Dread, and Father, for allowing us to be able to gather again this morning, dear Lord. It's always been a blessing to be here this morning, dear Lord, to hear your word being preached and hear the songs being sung. 
praising you, dear Lord. You are worthy of everything we do here today, dear Lord. And just pray, dear Lord, that uh, you be with the pastor this morning, dear Lord. Fill him with the Holy Spirit and give him mother, dear Lord, to say what you have him to, dear Lord. And I pray that he don't follow up on this fear, dear Lord. That we come here straight from you this morning, dear Lord. And this man that we're fixing to take out, dear Lord, I pray that you lead God direct us, dear Lord, to use it the way you have us to, dear Lord. Jesus Christ, name, I do pray.
enjoy that song, but uh, I just get, really get a kick out of it when Sister Robin <laughs> sings it. Beautiful singing, beautiful song. Amen. Open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Exodus this morning, and let's get chapter 1. 
Exodus chapter 1, it's the second Sunday of December, and this is a time of year when people are getting festive and getting in the mood to make much of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and certainly I'm all for that. And uh, this morning what we're going to do is we're going to kind of focus on the setup of the events of the book of Exodus, and we're going to do so in light of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Uh, for one of the great reasons that God had in recording these events for us in the Bible is so that we could... Uh, see prophecy of Jesus coming, and uh, Christ is seen in many ways uh, throughout these scriptures here. And uh, you've heard a lot of folks talk about the political correctness and how to refer to the season. Happy holidays. Some say uh, Merry Xmas. This morning I want to preach on Merry Exodus, all right? And we're going to look at the coming of Christ in this slide here as we have many truths revealed in the book of Exodus to us. Uh, the Spirit of God revealing things to us about salvation, uh, God revealing truths about the nation of Israel, and uh, gives prophecy about their future. There's some light there about the oncoming uh, tribulation period and the Antichrist, which in some ways is prefigured uh, by the one named Pharaoh. In the context, you'll have two witnesses uh, that are opposing him. In the book of Exodus, that's Moses and Aaron. Uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 11, you have those two witnesses prophesied of again. And uh, we won't get into all that this morning, but uh, again, that's the setup. And uh, the word exodus means to exit. And in the record of the children of Israel being delivered from Egyptian bondage, it causes us to see our deliverance from what we know as the bondage of sin. And even our deliverance from the course of this world, Ephesians chapter 2 speaks of, that is our place in this world, our, our association to this world. Egypt is a type of the world. And Israel was in bondage and servitude under the cruel authority of Pharaoh who was king of Egypt. And in that light there, for us, he represents the one Second Corinthians chapter 4 refers to as the God of this world. Uh, in Ephesians 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air. And uh, this is one of the remarkable things about the Bible. There's no book like it. Uh, some say, well, it's just a book. Well, listen, it's uh, the book of all books, and it's a book of which there are many books. And as we pointed out before, it is an inspired library, uh, God using many different human instruments that write the Scriptures at different times in history, different places in the globe, uh, some of them having different backgrounds, writing about different subjects, and yet in the end, the Bible appears to be one book with one author as one revelation is given to us about the one Savior. And the mind behind it all is the mind of the Spirit of God as He is the one author of the Scriptures. And in this marvelous matter, the Scriptures, while revealing to us history, can be cross-referenced to show spiritual and devotional truths, providing light at the same time about uh, prophetical matters. Uh, so this is remarkable. In Exodus, this is history. And these events, they happened. That in itself is amazing. Uh, it's the most amazing beginning of any nation in the history of all nations. Also, there's much devotional materials I mentioned uh, giving us spiritual insight to our experience of God's grace and God's power in the new birth and then there's prophetical material, and we'll eventually get to that. Maybe not this morning, but let me just go ahead and get started reading here in chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob. Now make a mental note of that as he's setting us up here for something. All the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already, and Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel, and remember Israel is the name of Jacob. It's already been referenced in verse 5. Uh, God called Jacob Israel. These are his children. These are his grandchildren. These are his great-great-grandchildren and so forth. It says they were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. 
So this new Pharaoh here sees a future threat against him, uh, sees a threat against his authority with these people, and he has a plan, and he thinks his plan is wise. He says in verse 11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And let me just inject here that the greatest periods of our fruit bearing and our spiritual development and increase is going to be whenever we're being tried. Whenever we're going through those hardships there, you see that way up there on the mountaintop, there's not a lot of growth. But down in the valley, that's where life will thrive, and that's where there's fruitfulness. Now he says in verse 13, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shiphrah, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. It came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. What he's trying to do is trying to ruin their potential to reproduce and grow and, and, and get larger. He's trying to ruin that potential there and he's going to save the daughters for labor's sake and integration purposes. We'll stop right there and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the Sunday school hour and the Bible Institute this morning. Lord, it's already been wonderful. It's been profitable. been good fellowship. Lord, I just pray now through the preaching of your word, you'll be pleased. Uh, God, bear witness to the truth. Help me, Lord, to communicate these truths in a way that can be clearly understood, in a way that your people will receive them. It will help them. They will be able to apply these things. It will strengthen their witness, their testimony, their desire to serve and please you. And it will strengthen our potential as being a light in this dark world, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as we think about this in the record of the context of, uh, of what is called the season, right? That's the way they refer to it. We we see a great likeness or similarities between the days of the birth of Moses and the days of the birth of Jesus. And that's understandable given that it was Moses that prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. He said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. So Moses and his prophecy was pointing them towards a prophet that would be like unto him. And of course he's speaking of Jesus there, who is the ultimate fulfillment of the promises of God. He's the Christ, and as the Christ, that means he's the anointed one. He's the anointed one, meaning he is the choice servant of God, prophesied in the book of Isaiah. He is God's chosen. He is the elect of God, the prophet like unto Moses. Not only that, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is Shiloh with the scepter, the star of Jacob, the anointed king of the Jews, the priest who's after the eternal order of Melchizedek. He is the Holy One of Israel. And when the Spirit of God uses history to give forth light to the promises of Jesus and His coming, He moves upon His servants there to record that history, uh, giving just enough information to where we, on this side of the cross of Calvary, we can look back and we can clearly connect the dots. Now that's why there, there's this information given to us there surrounding the birth and the coming of Moses so that we New Testament saints can look back and realize the truth about our Savior in that light that's given there in that historical account. Now someone says, why does the Holy Spirit do that? To what end and purpose does the Holy Spirit operate this way? Well, for one, it enlightens us to Bible history. And that's edifying. 
Uh, in, in this case here, we learn about the early stages and development of the Israeli people and of the nation of Israel and also of the man Moses. And listen, you, you shouldn't have to be a saved, born-again, Bible-believing person to appreciate the historical wonder of this record that we have in the book of Exodus. I mean, think about what a find it is. What a historical treasure it is there. There's information here about the man Moses. This is a historical character. This is somebody that's in uh, Jewish culture and in their history there. He's a revered man. And, and we should obviously be interested in what kind of man he was. And we're given that information uh, in the book of Exodus. We're also given information about the kingdom of Egypt, which of course at that time was a world power. And then there's information about the people of Israel there that would go on to inherit uh, the land of Palestine. That's all given in the book of Exodus. So there's going to be people that are going to spend millions upon millions of dollars uh, excavating and doing digs in the land of Egypt and all kinds of archaeological searches and Egyptian tombs they're going to be fooling around with. And they're going to do all that. They're not going to pay any attention to the information we're given right here in the book of Exodus. Now, this is supposed to show you there the pride of learning, the, the wisdom of man, you know, seeking out things, trying to study things there. And God gives us this record in the face of all that. Amen? Not against anything they find, anything they're digging up. It's just, why ignore this history that's given to us in the book of Exodus there? Because it flies right in the face of the pride of man, right in the learning and the seeking of human knowledge. Now, Another reason God does this is to increase our confidence in the promises of God. Amen. I'm talking about looking ahead to the promises which are yet to be fulfilled. We cannot help but be fully persuaded whenever we behold prophecies that were given and they've already been fulfilled and we find the historical record of their fulfillment. That increases our confidence looking ahead at the things God said were yet to come to pass. In other words, by the time Exodus chapter 1 is written there, the events of Exodus chapter 1, uh, the Spirit of God has the reader of Scripture already anticipating the arrival of the one called the seed of the woman. He already has us on the edge of our seat about one that's called the Lord God of Shem. He's already told us uh, he's the seed of Abraham. We've already got a hint of him and that God himself was going to provide himself a lamb. And I mean the drum roll for the coming of Christ begins early. Man has no sooner fallen in the garden that God shows up on the scene and gives us the promised solution. And He's the blessing of Isaac. He's the star of Jacob. He, he's the promised Shiloh, the promised one of Judah. And for all the promises that are given to Him about His coming, again, from this side of Calvary in the empty tomb, looking back, we see He came. We realize the fulfillment of all that God promised. And He came. And He fulfilled the many things that were promised concerning the first coming, concerning the work of salvation. And, and He accomplished all that at the cross. And what serves as a great encouragement to us all at this point is there still remains other promises that assure us He's coming again. And He hasn't come yet. Amen. And people say, well, have they been saying that forever? doesn't matter to a Bible-believing Christian. Because so much that God has spoken has already been fulfilled and come to pass. And so those things that are yet to come to pass, we can wait with breathless expectancy. It shall come to pass. It shall be done as the Lord has spoken. We can believe all that. Amen. Because of what's already taken place. And then third, the Spirit of God records history and cross-references prophecy so that as we look at these scriptures and read these scriptures, what are we doing? We're considering Christ. Amen. We're beholding the man. We're beholding the Lamb of God. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, just by what? Just by reading and meditating on the Scriptures. As Jesus said, search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. And so as we look at this, the way God has recorded history, and even though it deals with Israel and Egyptian bondage, and it deals with the coming of their deliverer Moses in history, we believers begin to see in that historical record prophecy about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we behold the man, we behold the Lamb of God, 
We see our deliverer. We're looking unto Jesus again, the author and finisher of our faith. And it's interesting to look back from our perspective and read and study the events of the book of Exodus and begin to think about the very coming, the birth of the Lord Jesus into the world this time of year. By the book of Exodus. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God for this written record. Amen. The Exodus is history. Yes. But as has been pointed out long before me, Bible history is His story. It's His story. And of course, Exodus is very much included in that sentiment there. And here's the thing. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt furnishes a remarkable, full, accurate typification of our redemption in Christ. What I'm saying is that as we study about how God delivered these people to form a nation called out by His name, that God uses this mighty event of delivering them out of this bondage and taking them through the Red Sea and on the other side destroying the threat against them, God uses that remarkable image to testify to those individuals that have simply believed on Jesus Christ and been redeemed. Now that's a remarkable thought. We learn about redemption and what we experienced, not only by the written record of the New Testament, but by the cross-references of the historical record of what Israel as a nation experienced. I want you to turn to chapter 15 of Exodus. Get verse 13 when you get there. And just setting things up in Exodus, what God wants to do first of all by His Spirit is show us the need for redemption. Redemption is the underlying theme of Exodus and He wants us to see the need for redemption. We have to appreciate the need for their redemption and that's pictured by the people that are enslaved. We see that in the first six chapters. And then next we're shown the might of the Redeemer. The might of the Redeemer. That's seen in chapters 7 through 11 by all the judgments of God seen in the plagues upon Egypt. God displays His might. God displays His power there. The might of the Redeemer is seen. And then third, we see the character of redemption as freedom comes by blood and power. Blood and power there, the Passover lamb. That's seen through chapter 12 through chapter 18. And then fourth, we're taught the duty of the redeemed in the book of Exodus. As the law is being emphasized there, but what's, what's really the subject is the thought of obeying God and following God, being loyal and allegiant to God. That's seen in chapters 19 through chapter 24. And then fifth, we have the provisions made for the failures of the redeemed. <laughs> And I thank God for that, amen. I mean, at the same time, God gave the law. He gave a blueprint of the tabernacle. You know what he says in the New Testament? He says, I've said these things to you that you sin not. And if any man sin, <laughs> we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And here God gives them the law, and then he says, here, you're going to need this blueprint for the tabernacle and the offerings and the atonement because you can't keep it. And God provided for our weaknesses and our failures. And that's seen in chapters 25 through chapter uh, 50, or chapter 40 rather. And so here I've got you in chapter 15, verse 13. And the things that I just mentioned, those five things about the book of Exodus are all seemingly found in this one verse. Verse 13 he says, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. See, he mentions there those words, thy mercy. Showing what? Showing the need of our redemption. It was necessary. It's a necessary ingredient that God be merciful to us sinners. Amen. God didn't get a deal when He saved you and me. Amen. He didn't save you because He needed you. He didn't need you and me. We needed Him, and God took pity on us, and God had mercy on us, and that shows us the need for redemption. And then He shows the power, the might of the Redeemer with the words, Thy strength. Friend, it wasn't just signing your name up to a book. Hey, man, that's, the, that's the result. We're in the book of life. I don't mean to disparage that idea, but I'm saying this, that our birth in Christ, the new birth, was a miracle of grace. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he shows us there the character of redemption. The character of redemption. When he mentions the words, led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. The character of redemption. God saved us for a purpose. 
and he's leading us forth. The responsibilities of the redeemed, along with our privileges, are seen there in the words, Thy holy habitation. That is the privilege of having God with us. Amen. That's, that's our Emmanuel. That's the message of the tabernacle. God dwelling with His people. That's the blessing of this mystery of salvation. Christ in you. The hope of glory. God is with you through Jesus Christ. Jesus, though seated at the right hand of the Father, is in you by the Spirit of God. He's given to you the earnest of our inheritance. Redemption as a subject much more to speaking to Israel nationally and they're being delivered from Egyptian bondage and history. God uses this historical truth to point forth to a greater truth concerning redemption. Namely speaking, those of us that have believed on Jesus Christ alone for salvation. We've been redeemed. The New Testament says in Colossians, Paul writing, he says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now setting all this up, what's going on in Exodus chapter 1? Let's leave Exodus 15 and go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And notice, in preparing the way for the entrance of the Deliverer in Moses, we're, we're made to think about the record of Genesis there and uh, understand the need for the coming of the Deliverer in the first place. He's referring back to Genesis. As we see there, he's talking about Jacob and he's talking about Joseph. Those are men in the record of Genesis. And uh, he, he mentions there, as we read in Exodus 1, that all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So I want you to think about that. What we, what we just read in chapter 1 of Exodus, all the souls that came out of Jacob, that, that's how they ended up where? That's how they ended up in Egypt. So it's by their father. You understand? It's by their father they end up in Egypt. One man, one man is responsible for all the people of Israel ending up in Egypt to begin with. You understand, uh, this, this is what would eventually bring about the sentence of death against them that we just read about, all those sons being cast into the Nile River there, and, and they're young, and then what would eventually, of course, bring about their bondage and their cruel and treatment. It was all by one man. He says they came out by the loins of Jacob. All right, that's how they entered into this situation that they were in there, and we're looking for devotional material. We're looking for spiritual application. And we realize, amen, by no stretch of the imagination, this is the way sin entered into the world. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And the way we got into trouble, the way we became sinners, the way sin got into us, was through our father. Our first father, Adam. And the unsaved, unregenerate state of man, naturally speaking, is a result of what happened way back in Genesis chapter 3. And that's the necessary truth in setting up our understanding for the need of deliverance there. Therefore, the need for a deliverer, the need for an exodus, amen, to be brought out of the situation we were born into, and therefore the need for him to bring us out, our deliverer. So it's no coincidence at all there that back in Exodus 1, we read about a man named Joseph. Why is that no coincidence? Because Joseph is the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Just the history of this man. Man, God uses many incidences of his life and his character and the things that he did in over a hundred ways in his history that God tells us about. You understand, God doesn't tell us all the history about Adam. Amen? He, he lives to be 930 years. Oh, you know very little about Adam in comparison to his life. And the same thing about all those men. But you know what he does? He tells you a whole lot about Joseph. <laughs> you say, why? Because the Lord is interested in you knowing about his son. And he can use a man like Joseph to tell you about Jesus. And he can use a man like Moses to point forth to the coming of Jesus. And, and the information back in Exodus 1 is setting up the coming of Moses, who is going to be a deliverer. The history here is of Israel's bondage in Egypt and the heroism of Moses, and it's for the purpose of light being given to us 
about the coming of the true deliverer, the ultimate deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. All the New Testament says Moses is worthy of honor, but not like he who owns the house and he who built the house. You know what Moses would do? He'd hold the door open for him. Amen. And let him come through very gladly. He'd be a doorkeeper for the one we're talking about this morning. He's greater than Moses. As great as Moses was, he's greater than Moses. And as great as what God used Moses to do, friend, it doesn't touch what God used Jesus to do. The Bible says God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that's what we needed. Amen. So this morning with the background dealing with redemption in the book of Exodus there, all this relevant history in the context of the coming of the deliverer that we know. I say Mary Exodus, amen. <laughs> Mary Exodus, if you've been redeemed, you've been brought out by the grace of God. You've been, you've been bailed out of a bad situation that you were born into. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 3, Grace be to you, peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The events of Genesis here in chapter 15 are giving us the introduction to what happens in the book of Exodus. And what takes place there. Genesis 15 is a record of, of what's going to take place in Exodus. Notice verse 1. He says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now God doesn't mince words and He doesn't try to be flowery. When He says something, it's for a purpose. You know what Abraham needed? Abraham needed the promise that God was his shield and that God was his exceeding great reward. And Abraham, like many of us, amen, God speaks and we're just excited that he spoke. But we miss what he said. And here God gets Abram's attention and he's excited. God's speaking to him, but he misses what he says. God has just been a shield. God has protected him as he went to bail out Lot and delivered him. He protected Abram through all that. But Abram soon forgets that like a natural man. He forgets about God being his protection. And he starts lying about the nature of his relationship with Sarah. Amen. Why? Because he was afraid. He was forgot God was a shield. And then later on, he's been waiting for the seed, the promised seed, and he gets tired of waiting, not realizing God was the exceeding great reward for his faith. He gets tired of waiting on that, and he works out a compromise with Hagar and ends up with Ishmael. Now, the important admonition for us there is when God's speaking, we better listen. Because it may be preventative for what's around the corner, just like it was for Abraham. Now it says there that the Lord spoke to him in verse 2. Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Remember the nature of faith is that God's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So this is not... Out of character. This is not um, Abram showing lack of faith. Uh, he wants to know about the reward there. What wilt thou give me? And he's wondering, is, is he referring to Eleazar? And, and it says in verse 4, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, not Eleazar, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And that's the Lord assuring him about seed. <laughs> And he says in verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. You know what God's doing? God's prompting his faith. God's about to give him a great big promise. And before Abraham has a chance to believe what God is saying, God's saying, Look up there. And he's made to have his attention on what God's already done. He made the stars also. And he said, I'm going to give you that many children. And Abram looks up there and sees those stars and says, God, you can make those stars. You can give me that many children. And the Bible says there in verse 6, He believed in the Lord and He counted it to Him for righteousness. Verse 7, And He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And He said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now this is the important reason. This is why we're here. Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? This is a covenant here. First of all, in the first part of the passage, we saw his faulty assumptions. Abraham 
about Eleazar, but then we read about God's faithful assurance and God gives revelation uh, towards the response of Abram there and that he believed the Lord and he's asked, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he begins to show him the, 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 the qualifier of the promise that he's given. And it deals with what's going to take place later. And he begins, to, what we know as history in the Exodus record from Genesis 15 is prophecy. And he tells him about what lies ahead. And he begins to point forth again, friends, to a type of Christ. Many pictures of Christ are seen here in verse 9. He said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old. Now, a heifer is a female cow. Let me just say this. I don't have time to get into all this this morning. But God uses, he'll use a male to establish the doctrinal truth. He'll use a female to establish the experience of that doctrinal truth. In, in other words, he wants to establish the doctrine of faith. He uses Abraham. He wants to show you the experience of the doctrine of faith. He uses Sarah. All right, just like you have the, the different offerings there, the male of the herd. Uh, he also talks about a red heifer, which deals with just the practical experience of being a believer and needing that water of cleansing every now and then, even after your sins are taken care of. That's good information, amen? <laughs> even after your sins are taken care of, what do you do if you come across something and you feel defiled? There's already a provision made. And that's that red heifer offering in the Old Testament. It's pointing forth to you and I confessing our sins as believers now and followers of Jesus Christ, God anticipating our weaknesses and our failures, going to Him and confessing our sins and receiving forgiveness by faith, just acknowledging God is just. Amen. He is just. He can cleanse me by the blood of Jesus Christ. And He can restore our fellowship. Well, this is a heifer of three years old, and it reflects the experience of Christ in humility. He humbled Himself. And it says a she-goat of three years old, showing the vicarious sufferings of Christ in the sinner's stead. He felt what He did for us. Amen. He felt what He did for me in my stead. He suffered. He knew pain. He knew torture. He suffered in my stead. And then he speaks of a ram of three years old. That's connected to the Levite offerings of consecration. Also speaks to the strength of Christ's righteousness. He speaks of a turtle dove and a young pigeon. That's portraying Christ as he that descended down from above. And he says in verse 10, He took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. What's going on there? We got some precious doctrinal truths we just talked about seen in those sacrifices Abraham's making. Some precious doctrinal truths. And he no sooner gets everything set up the way God would be pleased and how it's set up. And here comes that un those unclean things trying to get down on them. What does he do? He drives them away. That shows somebody being zealous about truth. Amen. Protecting the investment. Protecting the picture. Protecting the offering. We ought to be jealous about those things. Jealous about the truth of the Word of God. Jealous about the truth of the Gospel. We ought to be jealous, amen, about our worship and make sure it stays sincere and clean before the Lord. Verse 12, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Just like what Adam experienced when he received Eve there. A deep sleep. Picture of death. And lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And here comes prophecy about the Egyptian bondage. He says in verse 13, He said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a, in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Now that's a prophetical reference to the Exodus right there. They come out with great substance. Verse 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now this is a sevenfold prophecy which received literal complete fulfillment. It had reference to the sojourn of Abram's descendants in the land of Egypt. It has reference to their bondage there, their deliverance, their return to Canaan. Just to kind of lay out the details real quick first, Abraham's descendants are strangers in a land that's not theirs, according to this prophecy. That's verse 13. 
Number two, uh, in that strange land, they're going to serve. That's also verse 13. Uh, third, they're going to be afflicted 400 years. Verse 13. Fourth, the nation whom Abram's descendants serve, God's going to judge. That's verse 14. Fifth, Abram's offspring were going to come out of Egypt with great substance. That's verse 14. Six, Abram himself was going to be spared these afflictions because he says he's going to die in peace and he's going to be buried in a good old age. So this is going to happen after Abraham's gone. There, verse 15. And then seventh, in the fourth generation, Abram's descendants are going to inherit the land. All right? Now that's all mentioned there. When you compare what he says there to Exodus chapter 6, verse 16, you don't have to turn there, but you realize it was in the fourth generation that all this happens there. You have first Levi, the son of Jacob, who entered into Egypt with his brethren. Next there's Kohath, Exodus chapter 6, verse 18. And then there's Amram, who is Moses' father, and, and, and Aaron's father there. So you've got, you've got Levi, you've got Kohath, you've got Amram, and then fourth, you've got Moses and Aaron. Right there in that fourth generation, just like God said. Now, there's a reason that time has to elapse before all this begins to come to fruition in regards to that sevenfold prophecy God gave him in Genesis chapter 15. And for one, he speaks about the Amorites. And he says there, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Meaning that uh, God sending Israel in to possess the land was not only the Lord being gracious to the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it was also the Lord sending in judgment against the people of that land. Israel, under Joshua, are an instrument of God's judgment against the people of that land. And so you realize why they get in trouble there whenever they would spare them. Because they would provide mercy and it wasn't their mercy to provide. It was God's mercy. And God at different times, He may send in a flood in the way of judgment. He may send in fire in the way of judgment. In the book of Joshua, He sent in an army. And they were responsible for conquering that land and possessing that land there. And God's mercy in this situation for the Amorite was a timetable. They just had so long. It wasn't time for the people of Abraham to go into that land because the iniquity of the Amorites, he said, was not yet full. Meaning what? The situation didn't call for it yet. It wasn't time yet. You ever had God promise you something and you're waiting? <laughs> and you're wondering where the answer is? Well, the situation for Abraham wasn't developed yet. All that God promised, it wasn't set up yet. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, God reminds Israel, saying, Speak not thou in thine heart after the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not the good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. <laughs> Amen. God just tells the truth. He says, I didn't do this because you're good. Folks, he didn't save us because we're good. <laughs> Amen. Jesus didn't die on the cross because we were good people. He died for us because we aren't good people. Because we're sinful. And the people of Israel going in to possess that land there, they had to wait. Because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. And also, also, Abraham and his descendants, they just weren't up to the task of possessing that land. Not only was the situation not ready for them, Abraham and his family and his descendants, they weren't ready for the promise. So God had to take time to develop the situation, and in so doing, He had to develop the situation that they could inherit those promises. The situation had to be ready. It's not a problem with the Lord while we wait. It just might be we're not ready. <laughs> might be we're, we're not mature enough yet, or we haven't grown to a point where we can receive the fulfillment of His promise. You know, I mean, consider it, folks. Probably not something wrong on God's end. <laughs> it's probably us, Amen. <laughs> It's probably the holdup is with us. And Abram heard the promise that would pass down to Isaac and then to Jacob and then on to Jacob's family. It would eventually grow and multiply into a people that would possess the land, big enough to possess the land. The only thing is that it would take their time in Egypt while he was preparing them. And while they were in Egypt, a new king arose. Amen.
And they had entered into Egypt by their father and they were in bondage. And you know what they needed? They needed a deliverer. They needed redemption. And God sent one in. And Moses. And as great as he was, he was only a forerunner. He's only a type of the one who's really choice to God. The anointed one who was yet to come. And we look back, amen, and we say he came. Amen. What was prophecy to them is history to us. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His death was according to the Scriptures. His burial and His bodily resurrection the third day was according to the Scriptures. How can we believe the promises that are yet to be fulfilled? Because everything that's recorded in there was exactly spoken beforehand and it came to pass. And it gives us a sample to encourage our faith. So I ask you this morning there, have you been redeemed? Have you been saved? If so... Forget about this Xmas stuff. Amen. Think about Exodus. Amen. Think about your Exodus. The deliverer was sent into the world by the Father. He was the Redeemer to set you free from sinful bondage and from being associated to this world. He freed you from the course of this world. In closing, one man said this. He said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. And if our greatest need had been technology, He would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, He would have sent an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, He would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was salvation and forgiveness. And God sent us a Savior. The Bible says God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I want to ask you to stand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And I won't go into everything I had to say this morning. We'll pick up as the Lord will give us liberty to do that uh, next Sunday morning here. But think about it, friend. We rejoice in the liberty we have in Christ. No fear of the penalty of sin against sin. No fear of condemnation and that we're washed in the blood and Christ has paid for our sins. And we're glad we're not going to hell. Amen. Thank God we're not going to hell. But the Bible says He gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world. Ephesians 2 talks about how we were dead in trespasses and sins and we were walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past. You know what he describes? A change happened. Redemption took place. Freedom has taken place. Before the exodus, the event of the exodus, their crossing of the Red Sea, the children of Israel were a part of Egypt. They did not have a land of their own. They came in there by their father Jacob. They multiplied and they increased. And they began to suffer cruel bondage and served with rigor. And they were just part of Egypt. Part of the landscape of Egypt. Until God moved. Until a deliverer came that God sent in. And that's what happened with us. We were just part of this world. Headed for judgment. Headed for fire. Headed for destruction. That was our path in life. And after this life was over, we would have stood condemned before God to suffer eternal condemnation and damnation. But God had intervened. He sent a deliverer. Even before we were born, God took care of our debt of sin in the body of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, His Son, came in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. And He bore our sins in His body and He died hanging by His hands and His feet and He bled out so that we might be redeemed, delivered, from this present evil world. As part of the redeemed friends, we have an obligation. We have responsibility. Don't walk as one with this world. The world is not your home. You've made an exit. You were delivered, translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. You're a child of light. Celebrate your exodus. Live your exodus. Rejoice in your exodus.
by the blood and the Spirit of God, you've crossed over. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this new life we've received through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the Spirit of God that has sealed us unto the day of redemption. For when we get home and all this is made right and your sight, all the weaknesses of the flesh is done away with and this vile body is fashioned like unto His glorious body. Lord, we're looking forward to that. Until then, Lord, another day we pray that You'll change us. Another day we pray that You'll change us from glory to glory. Help us to get closer. Help us to know more. Help us to apply truth. Help us to draw nigh. God, I pray You strengthen us in our testimony and our resolve to be different because of what You've done. We pray if there's somebody here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior today, Lord God, deal with their heart. Show them the great need they have that only, only Christ can solve. We pray for them today in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, everyone praying. Sister Robin begins to play today. We'll have a time of invitation. This is just a time here of prayer. If you're saved, you understand. This between you and the Lord, it's nobody's business unless the Lord moves on you to make it public. We'll certainly... Let you do that. Many times, though, folks, just come and pray. Just renew some commitments and get some things shored up in their walk of faith. Get their feet of faith back under them, so to speak. Get their head turned around right. Get their heart in the game. This world's always picking at us and always distracting us. And it's easy to get, it's easy to get our head turned. And that's why it's important that we don't forsake our coming together and we come and hear the Word preached and taught and we get reminded, we get reassured, get helped. If you're here today and there's never been a time in your life when you were born again, there's no gradual change, there's no gradual progress, there's no improvement God's looking to make upon your life. There's a miracle that has to happen. Jesus said you must be born again. Coming to church is not going to save your soul. Giving will not save your soul. Turning over a new leaf is not the answer. You need a new life. You're dead in trespasses and sins and you're walking according to the course of this world. And your only hope, dear friend, is the one that came for you so many years ago. Died in your place by the grace of God tasted your death bore your judgment, suffered the wrath and the judgment against your sin. And then because it wasn't possible that death could hold him, he got up from the dead. God has testified through the empty tomb and seated him at his right hand. That's a son. That's the Savior. There's the Deliverer. There's the Redeemer. And to be redeemed, you've got to know Him. You have to receive Him. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon Him. Call upon His name. You come forward. If you have any questions, we'll meet you right down here with a Bible. We'll show you in black and white, book, chapter, and verse, the truth of the gospel, the way of salvation. You can leave knowing you're saved. Amen. All right, again, I appreciate you coming this morning and being here in church. I uh, hope you come back tonight, 6 o'clock, come praying. Uh, before we're dismissed this morning, Sister Jane has asked me to keep everybody praying for her sister Ann. Uh, tomorrow they're uh, going to be checking her eyes. There's some bleeding there. 
and uh, they're afraid she's going to lose her eyesight along with everything else she's suffering. Uh, just hold her up in prayer. Uh, God will have mercy on her and uh, upon her family as well. All right. Well, with that said, we'll go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Nathan if you would please pray for us.